Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on the biggest problems caused by suppliers and how to prevent them. Thank you for joining us. Um, our session is going to be led by Eric Evans, who will introduce himself in just a few seconds. But before we start, I just want to take you through some housekeeping rules on what to do during the webinar. Um, if you miss any of it, the slides and the recording are going to be available um, for you later, and they will be emailed to you in a follow-up email. This is usually sent out within the week. Please take time to complete the post-webinar survey that we have, and that will pop up on, on your screen to work at, well, at the end of the seminar. And lastly, if you have any questions that you want to ask as, we're, as, you, as we go along, please just write them down or you can type them in the question box and Eric will be happy to take them at the end of the webinar. So without further delay, I introduce you to Eric Evans. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Evans and I've spent something like 35 years working in procurement with suppliers. And in that 35 years, we've had just about every problem, every catastrophe that you could imagine. And so I do feel um, very qualified to actually talk about supplier problems. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is to share with you some of the solutions which we've been able to implement when we've had difficulties with suppliers. The agenda for today, um, I want to talk about some of the problems that we have, and I've got a slide coming up where we talk about perhaps 10 or 12 of the most common problems. But what I'd like to do is to spend more time this afternoon looking at the solutions, the things that you can do to preempt the problems, the things that you can do to identify that problems are coming, the things that you can do to, to mitigate the consequences and make sure they're not as serious as you would think, and what to do once you've had a problem to make sure that problem doesn't reoccur. So in a nutshell, there are three things in particular I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on what we can do before we award a purchase order or before we award a contract. And if you think about this, this is the time when procurement has more power over the supplier. This is the time when the supplier is anxious to win the business and will do more things just to win the contract. If I can be rude to the procurement profession out there, what we often find is that people use an RFP or an RFQ or an ITT, but they use this in a very ineffective way. They don't use it in a way which maximizes the leverage or the power which they have. And I'll spend some time a little bit later on talking about what we can do to maximize the pre-contract power that we have. Talking about contracts, I, I, I want to um, share with you a thought, which is a contract is not a legal document. A contract is a business document that needs to be written in a particular way, which makes it legally enforceable. And when we have a contract which is well written and well structured, we can actually use that as a working document, a working tool to be able to manage the supplier and limit the problems we have with those suppliers. This is known as contract operationalization, taking the contract and making it into a working tool, something that we can use to manage the supplier. The, the final um, factor I want to focus on is the fact that quite frequently in consultancy, one of the questions that we ask procurement people is how many suppliers they actually have. And it's quite frightening that many buyers don't actually know how many suppliers they have in total. Um, it's really, really, really important that procurement are in control of the suppliers, and this includes making sure that we know how many suppliers we have and that we're only using capable, the best suppliers. So part and parcel of the discussion this afternoon, I want to talk about something called supplier optimization which is making sure that we maximize our leverage by using fewer, better suppliers, people who are more likely to conform to our requirements rather than to provide us with problems. But I do need to start off talking about some of the problems that we have with suppliers. 
uh, and try and make sure that everybody understands the, the sort of issues which I'm about to address. If you think about it, in procurement, we're actually living in a very difficult world just at the moment. We have more problems than we've ever had before. In procurement, we're under more and more pressure to find cheaper suppliers. We're sourcing from China, from Mexico, from Indonesia, from the Philippines. And while there are many good suppliers in these places, the fact is because they are cheaper suppliers from different cultures, we often find that these cheaper suppliers are less able to meet our requirements. And one of the things that procurement often fails to do is to convince the management team that we actually need the best suppliers rather than the cheapest suppliers. Now, many procurement guys will agree with that, that if we're buying commodity items, it's one thing to have cheap commodity suppliers. But clearly, there are times where we want the best and not the cheapest. And, you know, as we, we have got cost pressures ourselves, whether you're the public or the private sector, we pass those cost pressures on to our suppliers. And what happens is many of our suppliers are now facing profitability issues. The more we drive prices down, the more we use competition, the more our suppliers are struggling to make a decent return on the money invested in their businesses. The inevitable consequences in that situation is suppliers try to cut corners. And cutting corners means quality problems or supply problems for us. Outsourcing. Increasingly, organizations are taking the view that they should be focusing on the things which are core to their business, not focusing on things which are peripheral or can be done by any organization. So many years ago, we started outsourcing things like cleaning, catering, distribution. Today, we're outsourcing things like IT, HR, training, even procurement itself. And a recent survey by KPMG, the accountants, found that 93% of organizations that outsource are actually dissatisfied with the service provided by the outsourcing organization. Somebody has to manage these outsourced service providers. And you know, we have problems too because we single source. We've gone to just-in-time systems where we have less inventory. So when suppliers are late, it's a bigger problem for us because we, we simply don't have the backup stocks. Our procurement departments have been downsized, and so we have less buyers to, to manage the suppliers. And one of the problems that I've been discussing today with 17 procurement guys on a training course for Informa is that very often procurement are only involved late in the process. And what you find, therefore, is users, budget holders, specifiers have actually selected the suppliers and done so without any procurement support. What that means is when we come to negotiate a contract or the sort of protection we need to deal with problems, we simply can't do it because others in our organization have committed us to these suppliers. And you know, the only thing that we really have to balance these scales is our supplier management skills and processes. And what I'd like to do is, is first of all, draw a line under this slide and just share with you a couple of real examples of supplier problems, just to put this in perspective. Um, guys, I have to tell you that when we send you this, this pack at a later stage, at the end of the pack, there are probably seven or eight slides which have much more detail than I'm going to show you today. So the slides I'll show you today don't have a lot of words on them. I'll talk through them, but there is at the back an additional pack of slides. So let me share with you a, a few stories that you may have heard of. Boeing. In 2007, Boeing outsourced much of its supply chain for the new Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Those of you who are interested in aviation may know that the Dreamliner was something like three years late into production. What you may not know is having outsourced the supply chain, these delays were caused by supplier problems and actually cost Boeing something like two billion US dollars. And if I just pause for a minute and ask how you would feel 
if you were the guy who had to go back to the chief executive and said, our supplier problems are costing us $2 billion. Barbie. Barbie is one of the most successful toys ever made. And in 2007, Mattel, the manufacturer, had to recall 10 million Barbie toys because the paint that was used to make these was a lead-based paint. What didn't make the press was that a number of children had actually bought the toys and succumbed to lead poisoning. Thankfully, there are no records of any uh, fatalities, but lead poisoning with young children is clearly not something to be scoffed at. Supplier problems. In the UK, we had a, a particular problem a few years before that, 1999. Um, an organization called Toys R Us, which I'm not sure exists in this region. Yes, it does exist in this region. One of the, the major American toy chains, which is, I guess, now a global organization, actually let down thousands of children when orders placed on suppliers didn't actually arrive in time for Christmas. Luckily, the parents were able to blame Santa Claus. But the reality is Toys R Us lost an awful lot of credibility. You know, a toy shop does something like 40% of its sales in the run-up to Christmas. Toys R Us took a serious dent that year, simply because they couldn't manage their suppliers. Cisco is an IT company that supplies components, services, consultancy to a number of telecoms and IT companies. They actually went out with a, a new IT system that was actually going to manage their inventory. And lo and behold, the IT system fell over. Customers were disappointed. This time, they actually managed to, um, to do worse than Boeing because this failed supplier-delivered IT system actually cost Cisco something like 2.2 billion US dollars. You may not have heard of, of Aris Isotona. Aris Isotona ceased to exist in 1994. Um, this was a consultancy client that I was working with at the time. The problem that we were trying to sort out was that Isotona had found some cheap suppliers and the senior management team had been rubbing their hands together saying, great news, look how much profit we're going to make. Unfortunately, these cheaper suppliers couldn't manage to meet the quality standards which Isotona customers expected. The long and short of this is that it lost half of its revenue as it lost its customer base and eventually went bankrupt. You know, in consultancy, we often talk about the need to, to segment your supplier base, the need to, to treat some suppliers as being more important than others. Clearly, you have strategic suppliers where you spend significant sums of money, and these supply critically required items to the organization. And then there'll be other suppliers who don't necessarily supply critically important items, um, and these guys often go underneath the radar. Let me take you back seven years ago. British Airways, one of its suppliers, the supplier of coffee and sandwiches, went on strike. This cost British Airways something like 50 million UK pounds. As passengers were told, as they boarded a 12-hour flight to Singapore, I'm sorry, there's no coffee, there's no food. We hope you don't mind waiting until you land in Singapore in 12, month, 12 hours time before we feed you. Passengers have a choice. Singapore Airlines, Qantas, Emirates, British Airways. The net result of this was a 50 million pound hit for British Airways. But this wasn't a strategic supplier. It was just a supplier that had industrial relations problems and British Airways didn't spot it until it was far too late. Tesco had a problem along with most of the UK retailers, the, the UK grocers, um, about 18 months ago when it was suddenly found that beef burgers and other products, other food products, didn't actually contain beef but contained horse. There's nothing really wrong with horse meat. The French eat it all of the time. The British perhaps aren't used to eating horse meat. But what really was of concern was that Tesco, Walmart, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, Iceland, most of the big UK food retailers had no clue what went into the products they were buying. Does this sound to you like good supplier management? 
when you have no idea whether the suppliers are actually meeting your specifications. And if we come on to, to the last couple, just, just a couple quickly. In, uh, in something like 1990, 1992, British Army went into Kuwait. Everybody knew we were going to go into Kuwait. The suppliers weren't able to supply uniforms in time. So the British Army went into Kuwait with winter weather uniforms, uniforms they would normally have used in the Arctic. They didn't have sufficient radios. The radios they had couldn't communicate with the American aircraft flying overhead. We lost more soldiers to friendly fire than we did to Iraqi fire. I can't make a joke of this. People lost their lives because the suppliers failed to supply the right number of radios. We had insufficient medical equipment. Surgeons were unable to complete vascular surgery operations quite simply because we didn't have vascular surgery kits. Soldiers had legs and arms amputated rather than having more straightforward operations. You know, we talk about Japanese companies like Toyota as being the, the ideal, well-organized, well-managed organizations. Last year, Toyota recalled something like 2 million vehicles where there were problems with supplied components. Suppliers had let them down. 2 million motorists have now, now have a different view of Toyota because Toyota didn't manage its suppliers in the appropriate way. Is this common? It's not only common, it's a growing phenomenon as we single source, as we reduce inventories, as we look for cheaper suppliers. And so the procurement profession needs to spend more time making sure that we are managing our suppliers effectively. It's not a new issue. This was a survey done in 2008 by a company called Gartner. Gartner is an IT consultancy, and they looked at how organizations manage their IT suppliers to identify the most pressing issues facing organizations. Now, not surprisingly, this is about vendor management challenges. But what they found was that most organizations spending considerable sums of money on IT hadn't actually become strategically important customers to their suppliers. They were buying piecemeal, dribs and drabs here and there. Nobody was taking responsibility for owning the relationship with strategic suppliers. Within the organizations, Gartner found that many organizations did not even have people who had responsibility for supplier or vendor management identified in their job descriptions and role profiles. Most suppliers have account managers. They have one individual who is responsible for managing a key customer. Yet many procurement organizations don't have one guy who's responsible for managing a strategic supplier. I'm not going to go through all of this list, guys. You can read it as well as I can. But it is quite scary that today, never mind 2008, we still have organizations where vendor management is not seen as a profession or a business function. We still have organizations where users, budget holders, and specifiers turn on procurement and say, you procurement guys have this habit of finding the cheapest possible supplier screwing him into the ground on price and then walking away saying you've done your job. We are constantly being criticized by our organizations for not finding the best suppliers and for not taking active steps to manage those suppliers and make sure they perform. You know, day-to-day -day problems. This was a survey that my company did a year or so ago. We talked to something like 500 organizations in North America, in Europe, in the, this region and in Asia Pacific. And what we asked was some basic questions around what are the most commonly found problems that you have to deal with. A lot of these are blindingly obvious. Late delivery, price increases, invoice errors. 60 to 70% of the people who responded cited those issues. Almost half said we have unacceptable quality from our suppliers. This has got to be an indictment of procurement. How can we say that we have almost 50% of us have problems, quality problems with our suppliers? Can you go to your senior management team and say, this is a statistic showing that we're managing our suppliers? 
Let me just stop with the, uh, the top point for now. No information on what is happening at suppliers. For many organizations, unfortunately, this survey found that supplier management is actually responding to problems. If there's no problem, we don't take any action. If there is a problem, supplier management is about jumping to attention and seeing if we can fix the problem once it's occurred. Surely, guys, I can't be the only person who thinks that what we need to be doing is preempting problems, solving problems before they occur. Some of these problems, although not all, we should be solving before we award the contract. Some of these problems, we should be insisting that we get early notice from our suppliers that a problem, a potential problem, is likely to become a reality. What we should focus on for the, the rest of the time that we're together this afternoon is not so much these problems, but what are the things that we can do to prevent these problems or to minimize the probability that they happen or to reduce the potential should they happen or to actually make sure that when they do happen, the consequences are not that serious. And I want to go through perhaps half a dozen different tools that we think are, are quite important. Forgive me if I use a sense of humor just to, to introduce this next slide and, and try and make a point. Um, today I've been very fortunate. I'm running a, a one-week course for Informa on best practice procurement. And today we've been talking about whether we need to find the cheapest supplier or the best supplier. And the consensus was with commodity items, low value items, stationary or whatever, we need the cheapest supplier. But there are things that are strategically important to our organization. And for these, perhaps we need the best supplier. And so one of the things that we reached agreement on today is as well as coming up with a specification or the scope of work of what we're buying, one of the things that we should do is think about what does the perfect supplier look like for our organization and we also need to have a specification for the perfect supplier and, and i said i wanted to use a sense of humor and uh, we have six ladies on the course and in a lighter moment what we asked the ladies to do was to close their eyes and just think of the perfect man and within seconds of the ladies closing their eyes and trying to think of the perfect man they all burst out laughing can you imagine what this did to the ego of the men in the room? The, the reality was that, that all six ladies had a very different view of what the perfect man looks like. And it's the same in an organization when you start thinking of the perfect supplier. The finance team have one view. The legal team might have a different view. The users might have a different view. Procurement might have a different view. And we're no longer in a situation where Procurement can go out there with strategically important items and decide alone what the best supplier looks like. So one of the things that we think is critically important in preventing problems with suppliers is for some sort of collaboration between the users, the budget holders, the specifiers, procurement, anybody else who has a legitimate interest in what's being supplied and we come up with a definition of what the perfect supplier looks like. And I use this slide as an example. We talk on this slide about tomorrow's suppliers, the suppliers we want to deal with in the future. Yesterday's suppliers are the suppliers we wish we used to deal with. These essentially are bad suppliers that cause us problems. The average suppliers are today's suppliers. So imagine you go out and you get competitive quotations from five, six, seven, eight suppliers. The blue supplier on this slide has consistent failure to meet specifications. He will only allow you to speak to his company through the account manager. The organization resists change, they're stale and predictable. And these guys give us more problems than the, the better suppliers, than tomorrow's suppliers. But unfortunately, these are often the cheapest supplier. So we believe that if we're going to seriously try and avoid having problems with suppliers or reduce the problems, we need to make a conscious effort to sit down with people 
within the organization and decide what are the criteria we should use to determine whether a supplier is a good fit for our organization. Should we focus on quality, their manufacturing processes, the information flows, their management style? Should we look at the size of the company, their financial stability, the culture of the organization? But without doing this, just focusing on something like price means almost inevitably you're finding the wrong supplier rather than the right supplier. Pre-qualification or due diligence helps. Making sure that with strategically important items, we, we spend some time testing the supplier to make sure he does meet our requirements. But this needs to be a more important part of the sourcing process. Unfortunately, in many organizations, we still rely on getting three or four quotations and taking the cheapest. Let me just broaden the, the scope of this discussion for a moment, if I may. I spent three years recently working with a, a, an organization in the tobacco industry. In the IT function, the IT department alone had something like 2,000 suppliers. We did some benchmarking. We went to talk to organizations like Walmart in America, Shell in the Netherlands, BP in the UK, and we asked their IT functions how many suppliers do they have. So just to repeat, my organization had 2,000 suppliers. Shell had seven. Walmart had 12. BP had eight. I want you to imagine what happens when you move from 2,000 suppliers to eight suppliers. You pick the suppliers who are the best suppliers, not the cheapest suppliers. Invariably, you have fewer problems. The other thing that happens is that each of the eight suppliers has 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 times as much business from you. Can you imagine how much more responsive they are to a customer who has 50 times more business than one who has 2,000 suppliers? This alone made a hell of a difference to, to these organizations in terms of removing supplier problems. Can your organization move to five, six, seven, 10, 12 suppliers? Honest truth is, it took these organizations a couple of years to do it. You may not get to five, you may not get to 25, you may not get to 100, but one of the things that we seriously have to focus on in procurement is reducing the number of suppliers that we use limiting people's ability to introduce new suppliers and making sure that we're giving the preferred suppliers, the better suppliers, as much business as we possibly can. And you know, when it comes to the type of supplier that we use, um, I, I've tried to use two little illustrations here to, to suggest a point, but if you look at the first illustration, you have a cloud with a black dot in the middle. And if you're dealing with a big company, a large company, maybe your business is just a small amount of business. And maybe the supplier doesn't take you too seriously. Some organizations are making sure that when they choose suppliers, they're actually giving business to smaller companies. And they're doing this for a reason. Your business to a smaller company would make you a much more important customer. If you are seen as being a much more important customer, then what that means is they take you much more seriously. You know, sometimes the things that we do are very, very simple. And the, the next slide, which I'm trying to show here, is, is something that um, an organization called Mazda in the car industry have been doing for a number of years. Mazda insists on having two suppliers for just about everything. And they split the business into three. So supplier A is guaranteed one third of the business. Supplier B is guaranteed one third of the business. So the question I can hear you all asking is who gets the third piece of the business? The answer is Mazda every six months 
look at which of these two suppliers has been the best supplier for the last six months and award the additional business to the best supplier. So the supplier who has the least problems, the supplier who's done most to improve quality, to deliver on time, to provide innovation. And you know, often what we find is that once we've awarded a contract to a supplier, we lose some of the power that we had. The supplier is no longer interested in being somebody who goes that extra mile because he's now got the contract. This approach by Mazda is a wonderful approach at keeping suppliers on their toes after the contract has been placed. Today in this workshop that we've been running, we had a, a number of the guys saying, you know, but the problem is Mazda can do this, and British Telecom can do that, and Walmart can do this, but we are not big companies like Mazda or Walmart and Toyota. One of the trends that we're seeing in Europe and in North America at the moment is the use of something called consortia buying. And this is where a number of small and middle-sized organizations collaborate and place joint contracts with suppliers. So if you look at the picture there, you've got a hundred little men tying down the giant on the floor. The idea of this is if a hundred small buyers collaborate and negotiate as one unit with some of the major suppliers, the supplier takes the business much more seriously. I haven't put this on a slide, but um, one of the things that somebody was telling me about a couple of weeks ago was a, 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 an organization called British Telecom, which is a truly global organization. And one of the things that British Telecom have done is they have produced and they publish a league table of who are their best suppliers. And they rank their suppliers in terms of on-time delivery, in terms of quality, in terms of invoice errors, in terms of innovative ideas that will save British Telecom money, in terms of the speed of response to problems. And British Telecom take this information and publish a league table of their best suppliers. They actually show this league table with each of the different industries they buy from having their own mini league table. And at the end of each month, these mini league tables are sent to the chief executives of their suppliers. So I want you to imagine you're the chief executive of a supplier and you get this table from British Telecom showing you are at the bottom of the league and that your competitors are performing better in terms of quality, delivery, invoice errors, innovation. If you are the chief executive of the supplier at the bottom of the league table, you are bound to ask questions of some of your staff. British Telecom have found this is a very simple way of getting the senior management team at their suppliers to take them seriously. They've also started saying that the team, the suppliers at the top of the league table will earn long-term contracts. The suppliers at the bottom of the table may well have to bid again for their business and are liable to be replaced if they can find better quality teams. So ladies and gentlemen, this table really is about trying to show something called supplier optimization, approaches that procurement organizations are taking to try and prevent some of the problems that they can see. This next slide is a, is a risk analysis tool. It looks quite complicated. It's very simple in concept. It's actually an engineering tool which has been found to be useful in managing quality problems and to be managing problems which people have with suppliers. Forgive me, it, it looks a, a very busy slide and, and let me simply explain what it, it does. The technique is called failure mode and effects analysis. It's a technique that came out of Japan in the automotive industry a number of years ago. And if you look at the first column, risk number, this is where each individual risk is just given a number, in this case 1 to 10. In the second column, periodically, every six months or so, the procurement team 
together with others in the organization, simply sit down and brainstorm what are the things that worry us with our suppliers? What are the things that we think could happen that if they do happen could cause us significant problems? And in this brainstorming process, everybody is encouraged to, to list absolutely everything that worries them. So you can see on the list here, exchange rate changes, maybe our suppliers will have strikes, maybe there are issues with intellectual property, maybe in this supplier there is one man, and when this one man is not there, the company is not as effective. Maybe we're concerned about late delivery if there's a long supply chain, or the supplier has quality problems or financial problems and so on. Nothing is ignored. Everything is thrown on the table. And then each risk is assessed in terms of how likely is it to happen? On a scale of one to 10, what is the probability? If it happens, how serious is it? So on a scale of one to 10, what are the consequences? How much notice would we get if this happened? What's the visibility? So what do I mean by that? I, I guess everybody's aware of the, the horrendous situation in Nepal where thousands of people have lost their lives. And the, the situation there is bad partly because you get no notice when there's an earthquake, a tsunami, this type of thing. If only we had six months notice that there was going to be a tsunami, people could move out of the way and plan for it. And it's the same with supplier problems. The ones that we really need to worry about are the ones where we have no visibility that something is going to happen. It just happens with no notice. The idea of this tool is you take these three numbers, probability, consequences, and visibility, multiply them together, and that gives you the risk value. And on this chart, the numbers in red are the high numbers where people say, this is a risk that's serious. This could give us big supplier management problems. We need to do something about this. Typically, this is once every six months. It's procurement with operations, with users, with budget holders. And it's then about what can we do to mitigate the problem? Are there commercial remedies, CR? So for example, should we be buying in supplier currency to hedge the exchange risk? CC, contract clause. Should we be putting into the contract a clause which says, for example, on supplier intellectual property, the supplier will warrant or promise or guarantee that he owns the intellectual property and he will indemnify us so that if there are any costs or liabilities because he doesn't own the IPR, he will actually hold us harmless and pay the fines and the costs involved. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there are very many supply risk analysis tools. This is simply one, but it is important that instead of waiting for a problem to happen, what we do is sit down periodically and try and identify the sort of things that are going to cause us problem in the future so we can deal with them before they happen. Very often, what procurement guys will do when awarding business is, um, is actually ask suppliers for references. Um, two weeks ago, I was asked by a consultancy client if I can provide references so that the client can award me a piece of work. And I was asked if I could provide three references. And I just want to share with you the thought processes that I went through. Can I provide three references? Absolutely. How am I going to provide three references? I took my three best customers out to dinner. It was a wonderful dinner. It was four courses. It was one of the best hotels in Doha. I arranged for limousines to pick up the guys I was taking to dinner. We ended the meal with wonderful cigars and the limousine was all set to take these guys home. And, and to be clear, none of this was bribery. Um, none of this was corrupt. 
All of this was accepted business practices with these three organizations. But just as they were leaving, I asked them if they wouldn't mind providing a reference. And of course they agreed. You, you do wonder, therefore, how effective it is just to ask our suppliers to provide three references. The most telling approach to references I had about 18 months ago when someone asked me for the name of three clients that I used to work with, but I don't work with anymore. And that made me stop and think. And what was going to happen was the client I was trying to win business for was going to phone these three guys up and say, why don't you do business with Eric Evans anymore? Is he too expensive? Is that the issue? Or was his quality poor? Or, or didn't he meet your requirements or whatever? I think we have to be creative guys in terms of how we get references, even if it's no more than asking for the full customer list of the supplier and then we choose which companies we're going to go out for references with. Even picking companies where we may know somebody at those companies because we've been on a training course with them or we're friends with them or we're related to them. In the absence of references, or maybe as well as references, one of the things that we need to do is due diligence. We need to send out questionnaires asking for information so that we know as much about the supplier as he knows about himself. We want to know about their staffing, their footprint, which countries they work in, what capacity they have, what equipment they use, what their management structure looks like, how much they've grown, how healthy their cash flow is, what technology do they use, what's their insurance cover. Clearly not for every supplier, only the important suppliers. And for the really important suppliers, one of the things that we need to think about doing is auditing the supplier. We need to think about actually going to visit the supplier, perhaps unannounced, and asking the supplier to show us the equipment that he says he's got. Show us evidence of the, the training schemes. Show us things like the ISO 9001 certificates. You know, I, I guess these days we all rely on things like ISO 9000. When I was in China a year ago, I actually asked one of the potential suppliers we were auditing for a client if he could show me the ISO 9000 certificates he claimed to have. And he asked me if I could come back in the morning. And when I asked why, his secretary actually said he has a little printer down the road. The printer prints the ISO 9001 certificates for him. The guy wasn't registered for ISO 9001, but he had a printer who quite happily print the certificates. You know, it's only when you go and meet the supplier or you actually phone up the ISO organization and ask, is this guy registered, that you find out whether you're dealing with good suppliers or suppliers who tell lies. If you're not careful, you're dealing, as the cartoon shows, with suppliers who hide their skeletons in the cupboard or sweep things under the carpet so you don't get to see them. We, uh, we are a company that, that does not do much advertising. We're a small company. There are just eight of us. And, and what we find is that rather than advertise in newspapers or print brochures, it's much more effective if we can um, do market research or do surveys and then publish the results of those surveys. And this wins us most of the work that we do. One of the things that we um, did about five years ago now is we went out to procurement organizations around Europe and we asked the buyers, how do you measure the performance of your suppliers? And the answer was, was quite awful. I, I, I make no apology saying it was quite awful. 85% of suppliers do not have their performance measured by their customers. All that happens is if something goes wrong, we react. If something goes wrong, we shout, we complain, we expect them to fix things quickly. Surely it's better to be measuring performance and looking for the trend so that we don't get surprised when something goes wrong 
and we've had an opportunity to do something about it. You know, this is a tool that's known as SPC, Statistical Process Control. Some of the best suppliers in the automotive industry and the electronics industry use this tool to demonstrate to their customers that they should not have quality problems. They use this tool to be able to demonstrate that they have processes and equipment which can meet specifications. And the idea is you ask the supplier to provide charts which show a number which is known as the CPK, which demonstrates that there is very low probability of a problem. Those of you who've studied statistics will look at the, the five CPK numbers at the bottom and see that where the CPK is greater than one, you have less variation and the supplier's quality systems give you readings which are very close to the specification. When you look at the CPK equals one, there is perhaps more variability. Other than this, you find the suppliers have problems. Using these statistical tools to actually find out if suppliers are capable of meeting your requirements is far better than insisting on inspection when goods are delivered by your suppliers. In fact, we've reached the stage now where most manufacturing organizations no longer inspect products coming in from their suppliers. They rely on something like statistical process control. Guys, if you can stay awake, I can just um, cover the next few slides in about five minutes or so. And then what I'd like to do is to see if there are any questions that you would like me to deal with. So let me go through a, a few things quite quickly, if I may. Governance is about making sure that once we've done a deal with a supplier, if it's a strategically important supplier, we actually agree, we understand and agree what the governance process is for managing the supplier. Just an example, first of all, like some of you may be aware that in 2012, London hosted the Olympics. And in London, it was a great success, but we had a few supplier management problems. The British government outsourced security to a company called G4S. These were the guys who were going to search you as you come into the, the stadium to make sure you had no guns or knives or um, bombs with you. And, and these were the guys who were going to search the stadium before the game started and so on. And there was a sudden phone call about six weeks before the Olympics which said, um, we're G4S, we have to tell you, we're supposed to have 10,000 security guards, but we've only managed to recruit 2,000. And the first question set in jest was, could we postpone the Olympics? Now that's a stupid question. And the civil servant who answered the phone call gave the, the, the straight answer, which is don't be stupid. The reality is we had to withdraw British troops from Afghanistan, from Kuwait, from all around the world to come and provide security at the Olympics because a supplier wasn't being managed. From the day the contract was in place to the day the Olympics finished, there should have been a governance structure in place. The triangle in this slide says at an operational level, maybe this is weekly or monthly meetings to discuss day-to-day -day issues. At a quarterly level, maybe this is escalation at an executive level to deal with any problems, and maybe there needs to be some sort of strategic dialogue between senior management on the supplier's premises and the client organization. The scary thing for me is how many times you have major strategic suppliers and in the procurement organization, in the customer organization, there is no one person who's given responsibility for managing that suppliers. Everybody gets involved with the supplier. We have a saying in the UK, each dog should have only one master. And it is the same with the supplier. We need to make sure that every one of our suppliers only has one individual who is managing the supplier. Sorry, forgive me, I just have a slight technology problem. There we go. I, I made a comment earlier on that I think 
Um, a contract is a business document, not a legal document. It just needs to be written in a, in a way which makes it legally enforceable. Once you have done your risk management, there is something about looking at those risks and working out how many of those risks do we have to look at and build something into the contract to make sure that the contract gives us protection against potential supplier problems. Unfortunately, we often leave the contract to the lawyers. Unfortunately, we often allow the lawyers to write the contract without procurement getting involved and doing what we can to make sure that the contract is something we can use as a way of managing the supplier on a day-to-day -day basis. This slide simply shows seven major headings which contain potential clauses that we might want to consider. So termination, for example. We may want to consider our termination rights if there's a supplier problem. We may want to consider the circumstances which allow us to terminate the contract if the supplier has quality problems, late deliveries, or whatever. We might want termination for convenience. And on the theme that the contract should be a working document, we really do need to think before we sign the contract, should we be building in performance measures for the supplier to work on? How frequently should we be asking the supplier to report on performance? What happens if they don't meet the KPIs, key performance indicators? What happens if they do not provide the measures? What happens if they lie about the measures? This is really a pretty key area if we want to make sure that we are managing the supplier, not just reacting to problems. Guys, I will move on quickly so we can get to the question and answer session, if I may. Contract operationalization is an American term that's been coined by an organization called the IACCM, the International Association of Contract and Commercial Managers. And they talk about the fact that we need to have a process to make sure we're managing suppliers. And this, in summary, is the IACCM contract management framework. There are some things we should do pre-contract, some things we should do post-contract, but the key issue is what should we be doing once we've actually awarded the contract. So this is about the big blue donut in the middle. In the additional slides that I've provided at the end of the pack, there's an explanation of what these things actually involve. But commercial awareness, for example, is about making sure that everybody understands exactly what the supplier is responsible for and what should happen if he doesn't do the right things. Not everybody in procurement, but everybody who comes across the supplier. So the users, the people who receive the items, are they aware of their rights and remedies if the supplier doesn't perform? Have we summarized the deliverables from the supplier? Have we defined who has the authority to change the contract, to ch control change, and what procedures are required? Guys, the, the IACCM framework might look bureaucratic, but it is a very powerful tool for operationalizing the contract and making sure that we are managing the contract not the supplier managing us. The English saying is that the dog wags the tail, the tail does not wag the dog. In a relationship with a supplier, we have to be the dog wagging the tail, not the tail being wagged by the supplier. This tool is about us being the dog and being in control of the process. I, I'm going to skate over this, guys. This is a, an interesting concept where some organizations are now asking suppliers, how good are we as a customer? The interesting thing is if you think about the problems that suppliers cause us, often those problems are caused because we're causing the supplier problem. So we're not giving them enough notice of our requirements. Our forecasts aren't good enough. We change the specification. We give the wrong message. Organizations such as Nokia, British American Tobacco, British Telecom, and Toyota, send questionnaires like this to suppliers and ask the suppliers to tell them, what are we doing wrong? 
What are we doing that causes you problems, which lead to problems for us? Guys, I'm, I'm going to summarize now and then give you guys a, an opportunity to ask any questions if you wish. I, I think what, one of the things that we need to be doing is, is, is thinking within the procurement team. Do we really want the cheapest supplier or would we rather have the best supplier? We need to consider, can we do business with fewer, better suppliers? Can we give fewer suppliers more business so they take us much more seriously? Do we have a systematic process where periodically we sit down and try and preempt what might go wrong? When we award business to a supplier for the first time, do we have an adequate due diligence process? Or do we just assume that what the supplier has told us is true and work with three references? Do we measure supplier's performance? Do we actively have a governance process which manages the supplier post-contract? Do we have a commercial framework which makes sure the contract deals with the risks which we think are going to exist? And do we have this contract operationalization approach where we're using the contract to manage the supply? Number nine is about do we ask the customer to rate us? And all of these nine points, ladies and gentlemen, are really about do we have the right approach to supply management? Because if we do, we will reduce the number of supply management problems. And if we don't, you guys are going to be busy. Can I thank you for listening? Thank you for giving your time to attend this webinar. And I'd be delighted to answer any questions you may have. I, uh, I've achieved one of two things. I've answered all of your questions before you've even thought of them, or alternatively, I've put all of you to sleep. Um, I, I'll make an offer if I may. Um, if you have no questions now, when you receive the pack of slides, if you do um, have any questions at that point, please feel free to send me an email. One of the things that I'm happy to supply to you, if you are interested, we have a piece of software. Um, it's a piece of software which helps you identify how good or how bad you are at actually managing your suppliers. It's a supplier management profiling tool. It's based on Excel. It is at no cost. You are more than welcome to a copy of this. Either drop me an email at the email address which you can see on this slide now, or when you get the pack, feel free to drop me an email then, and I will be delighted to send you this Excel tool. It allows you to just consider a number of aspects of supplier management and to determine how good your organization is at managing suppliers or where there are opportunities for doing even better. Thank you, guys.